Ben, did you lay awake last night because your wife's gone? I'm catching up to sleep. Mm. All right, choir. Stan.
right, good morning everybody. If I could have you stand with me, turn to page number 542. 542, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. My voice is a little off this morning, so I'm gonna need some help. I need y'all to sing out this morning. to see you. There's not a whole lot of you, but it's good to see you. I um, got to be careful. You miss this weekend. Next weekend's going to kind of count as 4th of July weekend if you're not careful. So I'm glad you folks come, uh, have, have come this morning. It sure is good to be together. Uh, you might have noticed we, we've gotten a little rain here lately, and it's warmed up quite a bit, right? That's a that's a key to us, right? Uh, thank God He took it easy on us for a while. And, and even now, we're getting the kind of cloud cover and rains that really do cool us off a bit. And I'm thankful for that. And if you have to be outside, you'll be thankful for it if you're not out there at the, at the wrong time, right? Uh, if you get caught in those immediate downpours, you won't enjoy it much. But it is good to be with you. We have many things that we're praying about there are some folks that uh, have some things they're dealing with. Please continue to pray for John Spain with his foot. It's been, been a little while since we've seen him, and, and we have the experience of somebody with that foot issue just stretching on for years, and, and we pray that that's not the case for Brother John. It is great to be together. We're thankful to be here together. Just as a, a word, we, we don't have Internet today, so we're just recording we'll push that thing up at some point which doesn't make any difference to you folks that are here and uh, the folks that 
try to watch by the live stream are going to find out that you can't completely trust that thing, right? Also pray for Brother Mike Gibson. He has some issues that are made worse by the storm and the rain, the barometric pressure, all that, and he has had a tough time. If you have pain issues that are made worse by storms, um, I'm sorry to say it's going to be a tough next three or four months. Uh, pray for relief for Brother Mike and for others that deal with that kind of thing. Um, yesterday was Deanna's birthday, so y'all make sure you tell her happy birthday at some point today, if you haven't, right? So um, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day to serve you. Lord, we're thankful to come and not only be in church, but be the church. Now, Lord, we pray that you would bless the things that are planned. Lord, we pray that they're your plans and not ours. We pray for leadership, direction, and power. And Lord, we ask that you would bless in these next moments now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the name of Christ Page number uh, 538, 538, blessed be the name.
right at this time the choir is going to come down if you'd welcome your neighbor this morning. If you join me on that last verse there, I can only sing the harmony today, so uh, I'm, I'm struggling with the melody. Uh, so I need that. I need the melody, the lead singers to sing out, please. On that last verse, His name shall be the counselor. His name shall be the counselor, the mighty prince of. again uh, we will have the offering here in just a moment let me encourage you there are, pl there are plenty of tracks out there take some give them out if you pay your bills by check put them in your bills if you pay them by ACH or online you can't do that right use them at drive throughs use them at the grocery store invite people to church right some people won't come if you don't invite them and uh, let me encourage you to at least engage at that level. If the Lord opens the door for you to go further, go further, but invite people. And you say, well, I don't ever talk to anybody. Well, you need to start talking to people, amen? Uh, we're supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to have some influence in this thing, right? And I, I, can, I can make up my mind not to talk to people, but they're gonna call on the phone, they're gonna show up at the door, I'm gonna have to talk to them anyway. So. Uh, try as I might, I, I still have to talk to people. Let me encourage you. Invite folks. Reach out to folks. Amen. Brother Stan, would you lead us in prayer for the offering, please? Amen. Thank you for the day, Lord. Thank you for the rain that we have, Lord. Amen. Amen.
All right, 423. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. 423. You can remain seated.
Man, this has the feel of one of those mornings, doesn't it? I'm going to need y'all to liven up a little bit, right? If you don't, I'm going to end up skinning you up. And I didn't come here to do that, but, it, but it'll happen. I promise you. Um, we would both like to avoid that. Um, good stuff to deal with this morning in Ephesians 3. You know that a, a New Testament church is, at its very basic definition, is a called out assembly. I don't understand why people don't join the church. I don't understand why people who are members of the church don't come. When Tamara and I became aware and, and cognizant of these concepts, it made it very difficult for us to be hit and miss. Um, I wish that that were a universal situation. I'm going to preach on the idea of how God has enabled us this morning. And in these scriptures, you're going to see a number of things. Number one, Paul put it down on paper for us. And it comes to us through preservation and inspiration. I don't want you to be deceived about what I believe about the Bible, okay? I don't believe God inspired the originals, and that's it, right? I believe this book's inspired. This book's preserved. If it's not, what have you got? You say, what do you base that on? The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All Scripture. And does that mean everything that calls itself a holy Bible is inspired? It does not. Amen. I'm, I'm going to try out just a little bit, just a little bit. Now, y'all bear with me. I've been stuck on this thing. I can't get rid of it. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Last week, first time in my life, I pointed out when Abraham looked up, lifted up his eyes, he did not see a group of rams in a thicket. There wasn't but one there. John the Baptist was known as the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Amen. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying God's got a book in English. That's the one we believe. That's the one we preach. Amen. Now, y'all stay with me. I'm not roughing you up. I'm just trying to, to get a thought. I mentioned last week, I said, how do I know that? I know that because that's how God works, right? Every apostle did not have the authority that Paul did. Paul seemed to be the afterthought, right? The one he referred to himself as born out of due season. And at that point, there was one person on this earth that had that authority. There was one person on this earth to whom was given that revelation. Um, our culture seems to believe in multiplicity, right? We're going to pick us out of God we like. Well, then we'll get us a book we like, go to a church we like, we'll go when we like, and we'll go somewhere else when we like. Amen. That is foreign to the New Testament of Scripture, even in the perversions of the New Testament. Amen. Well, that was good right there. Now, I'm not looking for a fight, but I won't run if one comes up. Amen. Too many folks here to run me off. Amen. Uh, just want to dig in on that idea. Because here's what I know about our culture. It continues to beat and chew and tear away at the things that we believe. 
You say, well, them other churches, buddy, they got the crowds. Well, God said it, it's going to be like this, right? In the last days, men shall depart from the faith. Boy, they have, hadn't they? I wonder how many, how many of them were ever in the faith to begin with. And we're not talking about people that are sick or they've got something. We're not talking about people going on vacation once, maybe even a couple weeks a year, right? That's reasonable. And I used to talk about friends of mine that took seven or eight weeks of vacation a year. They'd only been at a church a year or two. That gave me concern. And I don't have a thing in this world to brag about other than my wife and my kids, right? My salvation, my Bible, the local church. I don't have anything to brag about. I got some decent tools, a few nice guns, right? We just keep them in the safe, right? Keep them locked up where they can't hurt anybody. You know how that is, right? There's probably one laying on top of the safe right now as we speak. But it's because I forgot to put it back in there this morning, right? You know what I'd do if I was out of church, if I had to move to a different part of the country? I'd ask God where he wanted me to go to church. I can't be trusted with those types of decisions, right? Some folks say, well, we like to go where the music's good. Where it's not too bad, right? That doesn't have a thing to do with it. And, and our world has tried to relegate all of worship into what is called a music service. That's foreign to both testaments of Scripture. Instruments and singing are used in worship, but they are, ne are not and have never been the definition of worship. See, we're fighting all this over sowing of the fields. Don't talk to me about the tares because that's an end of the world judgment um, parable, right? Amen. And, and I'm probably guilty of rooting one or two folks up in my life. At least one of them was absolutely necessary. Don't let people use your Bible on your wrong, right? Don't, don't, don't try to let them tell you that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same thing. Because they're not. Because God's not silly. He's, he's not going to do that to you. He, he's not going to make it that difficult for you to figure out. And the Bible tells us that, that what we have in our Bible is what God wanted us to have, right? So that, you know, all, if everything Jesus ever done was recorded in Scripture, all the books in the world couldn't contain it, right? So we know that we have the salient, the very important things. And from who is not only the apostle to the Gentiles, but also the apostle to the church age, the apostle Paul, he has preached these ideas about our enablement. And they are real whether we know them or not and whether we access them or not. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying in my introduction, we ought to take advantage of everything that God's given us. Everything that God made certain that our apostle wrote down for us, okay? He preached these concepts. But if you'll read in this scripture, and we might have to back up a verse or two, and, and I'll make sure you catch it. Paul prayed for this Ephesian church to have these things. And through the inspiration, preservation, and canonization of scripture, not necessarily in order, God made sure that we have these things that Paul prayed for us as well. I'd like to ask you a question just to make you think, did Paul have us in mind when he said he prayed for these things? Tough to answer. I don't know if people tell me this, well, even Jesus don't know. Now, Jesus said he didn't know when he was coming for us while he was on earth. I tend to believe he knows now. But I, I won't fight with you over such matters. But I know God had us in view when he put these scriptures in this form and made sure that we ended up with I know God had us in view. I don't know whether Paul had us in view or not. I don't know if Paul ever even knew 
how great his influence was going to be. I wonder if he's not walking around heaven just shaking his head half the time saying, I had no idea God was going to use me to do all that, or if he had some inclination. Don't know. I'd like to know, but I'm not sure I can know until I get there. Not only did Paul preach these things, he prayed for them and by extension us about these things. He put them down on paper and he pled with these folks that they might understand that these, they have these things at their disposal to use as they need them. So we're talking about our enablement. I'll give you by Scripture to supplement the Scripture we're going to read in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. The Bible says that He hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. He wasn't just talking about preachers. He's talking about all of us. We, we can minister the New Testament to others. We can show them, and, and we tend to reduce these things, right, to leading somebody to the Lord. But, but ultimately, they're part of discipleship, and you can't have discipleship outside of a local church context. So y'all quit telling me you can, okay? Um, people quit asking questions. The, the local church is part of discipleship. For some people, that takes a little while. And for a lot of us, it takes the rest of our life. And I believe that was the, the, the idea. If those men that followed Jesus around for three and a half years could have, they would have followed him around for the rest of his life, the rest of their life, or, or the subset of both together. Say all that to say this, the Bible plays a very important role meaning that we need to know the things that we have at our disposal. And in Ephesians 6, we'll be there at some point. Paul tells us what we have as, as protective armor, but also as offensive assets. You say, hold on a minute. I've heard of the whole armor of God. Well, if you keep reading the Bible, or reading, right? You keep reading, you will read that we have the sword of the Spirit. The sword is an offensive weapon. It can be used defensively to be certain, but it's an offensive weapon, right? I mean, it works great as defensive, but its real use is to poke somebody with it, to slash somebody with it, right? I know where I am in this message. Y'all stay with me just a moment. Wednesday night, we, we were preaching from, I believe that we're actually teaching and got a kind of new thing going there that I've not really adapted to. The people seem to like it. We'll see how it goes. But teaching a big psalm, right? Psalm 37 is pretty big. I think there's 40 verses. And one of the points within that outline was deliverance, right? And I said this about that point, and part of their fill-in had to do with this. It was self deliverance for the large part. So what do you mean by that? It means you have these things at your disposal and for you to use them, right? People say, well, I, I want to be delivered from a spirit of adultery. You need to quit whoring around is what you need to do. Amen. That's up to you, right? Just like we mentioned in, in Sunday school this morning, folks say, well, I'm going to do this for a little while. I'm going to sow my wild oats. You've heard that phrase, right? I'm going to get it out of my system. No, you're not. You're going to build it into your system. Well, I'm just going to smoke for a while, get it out of my system. No, you're not. You're putting it in there. And you're putting in there not only that, but the desire for that as well. So in a lot of our Christian life, there's self-deliverance, Okay. And see, if everybody came to every service, we wouldn't have to do near as much backtracking, right? <laughs> Paul preached these things. Paul put these things on paper. He pled with the people, and he prayed for them to, to understand these things. So let's read verses 14 through 21 in Ephesians 3. There's a lot here. And the outline that I have for you is not going to give you all of it, but it's going to give it to you in a, in a package Maybe it'll help you understand it. 
verse 14. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sound like somebody's getting ready to pray. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you according to the rich of his, riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Four dimensions. All right, class. What's that mean? It's a pyramid. It's taller in the middle than it is on the sides, right? We've, we've been exposed to that. I believe the new Jerusalem is going to be a double pyramid, base to base. You don't have to believe that. It's okay. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Now that's something, isn't it? You, he says there's something that passes knowledge, but he wants you to know it. You say, what does that mean? I, I believe it means that it is available enough that it is expansive enough that there's more there than we will ever need and we will never be acquainted with all of it and to know the love of christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of god now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him now now pay attention to this last verse Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You know, our, our existence here may end, but ultimately, world without end, meaning that time will pass into eternity where time cannot be really counted and there will be no end to it. Paul preached, printed, pled, and prayed about these things. Father, I ask this morning you would bless this study. Allow us to preach it as a message. And Father, may each and every one of us be better equipped. May we be better enabled. May we be better aware of the enablement that you grant us in Christ by the Holy Spirit of God, which you give inside of us to live this life in your power, by your help, that there might be glory unto you in this church until all of us are gone. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Paul is writing here about a life that is available, a life that is accessible, right? A, a life that is even observable to others. They're not going to understand it. They, they can't even see the kingdom of God if they're not born again. That's right out of Matthew chapter 3, right? Except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You won't even know it exists. And there are people that argue on the internet and in person that there is no kingdom of God. And I find that hilarious in that the Bible talks about it at such great length. So we see in verses 14 and 15 the secret. The secret is this. is made up of two parts. A is our access to the Father. The Bible says that we're to come boldly before the throne of grace that we may be able to obtain mercy, obtain mercy to find grace to help in time of need. We have access to the Father. We have open access 24 hours a day. And we, Brother Raymond and I were talking the other day, this, this world has become so 24 hours a day that people think, well, well, we need to go to church on Saturday night. That's the only time we can go. And most of them, that's not true. 
They just have something they want to do on Sunday. For most of them, it's not true that that's the only time they can go, but that's the most convenient time for them. When has God ever in history, or where do you find it ever in the Bible, that God says, whatever you can do, if you just give me a minute here and there, I'll be pleased with that. Never read it. Bible has a lot to say about getting up early in the morning. Bible has a lot to say about spending time with God in the book, not only in the book, but also in prayer. Bible has a lot to say in the New Testament of Scripture about us trying to reach other people with the faith that somebody reached us with. Ultimately, that somebody's God Himself. But we have access to the Father. And I was under a pastor one time. He, he believed that soul winning was a gift. I said, you know, I, I will agree with you that some people may have a gift and be more successful at it, but the biggest part of that gift is trying. He said, well, I believe we can pray people in. I believe that prayer is important and that it is a part of it. But there aren't all these divisions of being a witness. And I do believe we ought to pray for people to be saved. We ought to pray for our people to have the opportunity and, and to have the experience of leading someone else to Christ. But there's our access to the Father. A is the first part of the secret. The second part of the secret is our acceptance by the Father. Bible says in the uh, I believe it's in the first chapter we we read that we preached there that we have been made accepted in the beloved. I've said many many times I know I've said it at least a few times in in this particular series of messages that in Christ in Him in whom the pronouns as well as the noun itself in the Lord, in our Savior, in God. That's the most important phrase in Scripture is that we can be in Him and that we have all this available in Him. But today it's become so popular to spend so much time outside of Him and we act like He's an errand boy. The Bible does not describe that in any book in the Scripture. The, that idea is absolutely counter to what the Bible teaches about God the Father and His eternal preexistence, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, and their individual pre-eternal existence. I'm sorry to use a little bit of big words on you, but, but what I'm saying is this. We are fashioning... The, the noted atheist Voltaire said, yep, God created, his man, created man in his own image and then man returned the favor. People tell me oftentimes and in different ways, and I'm an insufferable smart aleck and it runs through my head and I don't say it because it would sound so bad. They say God understands. Well, I'm sure there's nothing that he doesn't understand, right? But I know this above all else, God understands be and do. God understands effort in place of excuse, right? God understands become, not remain, even though he has given us all these things in Christ. In the next chapter, we'll get to what I believe is, just like I said, I said the other night, it is self-deliverance to a very large degree. And in chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians, it's what I call God's principle of replacement. That's discipleship. In fact, there's not a great deal of theology in discipleship. There's a great deal of theology, right? Some duology but that principle of replacement is essential to the christian life it is part of discipleship so we have the secret there in verses 14 and 15 
And we see the sources in verses 16 through 19. And it gets a little thick in here, okay? A, in verse 16, that he would grant you according to the rich of his, riches of his glory to be strengthened, strengthened with, I can't say that word, to be strengthened, not strengthened, strengthened with might by his capital S spirit in the inner man. So the sources are A, the invincible Spirit of God. The invincible Spirit of God. And there is a teaching in New Testament Christianity that the Spirit will no longer be here when God raptures all the Christians out. And I would depart from that only thusly. The Spirit of God is God. Just like Jesus is God and God the Father is God, and omnipresence is one of the first things I ever learned theologically. But that is an aside. So we return to the Scripture. The sources of our enablement are A, the invincible Spirit of God. Sometimes you and I can feel beaten. He is never beaten. Sometimes we are tired but he can lift us to fulfill the necessary duties that, that we may have, whatever they may be. Not only to do scriptural things, but to live this life on this earth. The invincible Spirit of God is at your disposal. But the way God tells us to go about that, some of it's even established in the Old Testament, right? That we're to trust in the Lord with all our heart, and to not lean unto our own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. Well, the New Testament hymn is the Spirit of God, right? In this application, in all our ways we acknowledge Him, His presence not only with us, but within us. Amen. To be fully aware of that all the time. See, you can't really leave him at home. You can grieve him. You can quench him. And when you say, Lord, I, I can't witness that fellow, he's going to leave before I get over there. I'll never be able to get there in time, Lord. Amen. He's invincible. We're not invincible. There is something within us that if we were to die by any number of possible ways, the Holy Spirit's going to take that part of us to heaven. Secondly, look at verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You say, what is that? That is the indwelling Son of God. Paul referred to the Holy Spirit of God in Colossians 1.27 as Christ in you, the hope of glory. The reason I have a hope of glory is because God's Son lives within me. Now, I'm in Him, but the really good news is He's in me too. It's the only way the scale will ever balance. The indwelling Son of God. I've been made a son of God by receiving him as my savior. But I have the son of God dwelling within me. I've been made an heir of God and a joint heir with him. Say, so how's that possible? Well, it'd be tough any other way. Because he's in me and I'm in him. We're going to split this thing up, right? Going to be hard not to share. Because even though we're two different things, I'm in him and he's in me, now that's a tough thing to sort out. The indwelling Son of God. Do you know that you're indwelled by the Son of God? That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. 
which would not be possible on any even micro level if we didn't have the ineffable salvation of God. The salvation of God is what gives me that invincible spirit, which results in me having the indwelling Son. I got it when I received Him as my Savior and was given the ineffable salvation of God, which results in three things. Number one, God's love experienced. Number two, God's love examined. We just read a little bit about that. We need to dig into this thing, right? The Bible says that we're to... Oh, how does it say it? To something out... Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We need to get in there and find out all about it. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, let me ask you this. What if somebody gave you a grand and vast estate? You'd be pretty excited about figuring out everything that comes with it, wouldn't you? You think, man, all this money's nice. Boy, this private island is nice. This boat that's parked right out here, right beside the other boat, one's a fishing boat, the other one's like a, a sightseeing, have a party, good time boat, right? And you go and you do everything you can, you arrange your travel, and then you find out, I've got a private plane at my disposal. I don't have to arrange travel. Now, I go anywhere I want. And hold on, I've also got a pilot with that private plane at my disposal. And on my yacht, there's a crew. Amen. Some people live that way. I realize most of us don't know any of them. We probably wouldn't want to know any of them because it makes you a different kind of person to have all that, which is exactly what being saved does. It makes you a different kind of person. Amen. God's love experienced. Secondly, God's love examined. And I always use the word expressed, but I like this one a little better. We experience God's love we examine, we dig into it, we want to find out everything about it, but then we exhibit God's love. Now that's something different, isn't it? More than just to express His love, we exhibit it that it can be seen of others. One thing about our church that is strong, it's very strong, but we have to figure out a way to, to cause that to cause us to multiply. Because it's a secret, like this secret that we talked about in point one. It's too big a secret. Hereby shall they know that ye are my disciples if you have love one for another. Now, if you come here and you experience this for a little while, it's easy to see, especially if you have spiritual eyes. But we have to somehow produce that in some sort of wholesale form. To exhibit God's love. Do you understand when somebody comes here and they give you some finite amount, right? That's going to change. I need $80. I need $31 to be able to get my phone turned back on. I need $47.50 to pay the very last part of my rent. You would be far better off to pray for them than you would to dig in your pocket. And I know that that can sound like an excuse. It's not. Because handing somebody money does not equal love. And I'll prove it to you. Anybody in here ever got alimony? You know what that is? That's giving money to somebody you used to love. Now, I have some friends that, that have been divorced, okay? And, and they're one of my friends, good guy. He, he has a lot of money to play with because he's a very industrious, hardworking man. 
And I can remember a time when there was a crisis with his children. He had gone down to Sebring to see about it. And the ex-wife's new boyfriend came out there and he was going to tell everybody what it's like. And he said, sir, you better, you'd be better off to go back in there and, and go back to laying on my couch. Because this ain't none of your business. That's what I'm saying, right? That's somebody you used to love. Amen. I know we all love each other permanently, even with divorce, right? I'm, I've seen different things, but I don't know. I, I don't know about you. I, I don't know if I could do all that. And, and you know, folks say, "Well, God's for marriage. God is for marriage." And I'll tell you why. Life's complicated enough without having two families. Amen. Without having to experience two different sets of in-laws. Right? Say, what are you saying, preacher? We should divorce that guy and marry his brother? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, giving somebody money does not equal love. It may be right to give people money. I'm not saying that this is always wrong. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. They'd be better off to see your Christianity as opposed to your wealth or lack of wealth, right? You know what I got in spades? I got a lack of wealth in spades. Amen? There's a bunch of stuff that if I had plenty of money and didn't have to worry about it, I'd buy. You know, I had a revelation yesterday. I didn't even tell Tamara about it. I said yesterday morning, I know she had thoughts that I wanted a particular firearm well you know what i found out yesterday the firearm i said i wanted doesn't even really exist it was a confusion so i don't even want it anymore amen well that's a victory isn't it for somebody god's love exhibited I'll tell you about a man can't remember his first name his last name was easter day his wife woke up before they were supposed to get up, had to go to the restroom in the middle of the night. Somehow there was a piece of clothing or something that ended up by the bed, or she just stepped on the clothing she was wearing, and she slipped, hit her head on the nightstand, and she was dead before she hit the floor. And within a year, someone picked his daughter up who was out of fellowship with God, and they partied together, right? Whatever that means. I've been to a party, but I don't party. You understand? I'm tired of people trying to turn a noun into a verb. I'm probably guilty of it somewhere, though. And they ended up being together for most of the evening. And at some point the next morning, she was found dead, killed by this man, she had gotten together with in a beer joint in Winter Garden. By the way, if, if you don't take anything, you don't want to go to a bar named the Brass Rail. You might think you do, but you don't. There's one in Winter Garden, there's one on 15A in Narcusi, or there was 35 years ago. You don't want to go there. And we've seen other examples of this. And I may even point out, at that man's trial where he was convicted, victim impact statement before sentencing is passed, Brother Easter Day told this man from behind a podium in a courtroom in Orlando, I want you to know something, sir. You killed my daughter. You're guilty. You've been adjudicated guilty but I have already forgiven you. And as an act of, of love, God has me praying for your salvation. Now, I know this. You say that in a big crowd, every man in that crowd step one, one step back say, I couldn't do that. Why? Because that's not human love. It's not. A few years ago, my mom was sick. We are trying to figure out what was going on, that kidney thing. I was down in Orlando on a Wednesday, and 
had been paying attention to this case in Dallas where this little girly cop, right? She was a girl. She went to the wrong floor of her apartment building to what she thought was her apartment. And when it wasn't, she's, again, she's under the impression it is because they look exactly the same on the inside of the parking garage, right? She goes, and the door's standing open. And a guy comes out and says, hey! And she says, get out of my apartment, and things ensue, and she shoots that man, and he dies. And this man's family is saying all kinds of horrible things. And a young man, he's 18, 19 years old, he stepped to the podium and said, Ms. Geiger, I forgive you. You don't need judgment. You got plenty of that. What you need is forgiveness. I forgive you for killing my brother. And he asked in the middle of a courtroom, victim impact statement, says, Judge, can I give her a hug? That's God's love exhibited. And it's rare as hen's teeth. Rare as frog hair, right? But that's the problem. This world doesn't see enough of that because we're too busy arguing doctrine with people that don't know anything because they're lost. Or we're arguing politics. You're going to get your way one time, right? You're going to feel good about it. And the other side's going to be... We do not need to continue to contribute to all this rage and wrath in this world. And we're going to get to that in a couple of weeks. Let all wrath and anger, bitterness and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. God's love experience, God loves, God's love examined, God's love exhibited. Then lastly, verse 19 and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. The infinite sufficiency of God. The infinite sufficiency of God. You say, what, what does that mean? That means God is always sufficient. God is always able. We've already talked about how we always have access to and if he chooses not to, we have to know that he could have. But he chose something different. And we can rest in that. We can rest in the fact that if God took a notion to heal any one of us of any malady we might have, that he could. And we need to, to not only believe that he can, but that he will until he proves otherwise. Lastly, the scope, verses 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. A, an, inexha an inexhaustible power. An inexhaustible power power you know the the thing that we get to see most frequently that that has just a seemingly an inexhaustible power would be the sun but then there's lightning we have products on our um breaker panels that are meant to clamp spikes and supposedly they're supposed to keep us from wasting electricity. But if we were to take a direct hit from lightning, you know what the explanation is? Well, it's lightning. There's nothing you can do about it. That's just quite a power, right? We, we can't really make anything with that level of power. But God's power is inexhaustible in ability, number one, and in availability, number two. Now, I pray for God's power. 
But my second prayer for God's power would be for my wife, my kids, this church, to experience the accessing of the power of God. You, you realize it doesn't take a lot of power for God to inconvenience you. Joe was telling me about something the other day. He said, do you think I'm crazy? It's like, no, you're not crazy. It's not bad. It's not a bad idea. And he said, and I know it would be an inconvenience. I said, but that's what helping people is. That's why they're so grateful when we help them because it's at the very least an inconvenience, right? The problem is in America, we think everything has to be convenient. And, and look, you folks aren't even getting arrested on a regular basis. Let me tell you something, that is inconvenient. Get put in jail, right? Have to get somebody to bail you out. Have to go through the shame of that whole experience. God's got plenty of power. And it is available. To get you beyond the worst things that ever happen in your life. Secondly, there's an inexhaustible power. Secondly, there's an inescapable purpose. To glorify God personally very short praying for a kid to get saved all week in camp in 2013 everybody likes this kid problem is he's a bad kid he's very charismatic people like him praying for him to get saved comes from a horrible home and he didn't want to come to camp his parents made him come to camp so that they could get a break from him for about five days he went from murphy north carolina down to Hiawassee, Georgia, which is really only about 15 miles. Those kids were praying for him. And I remember there's a kid, his name was Luke Woody. Everybody called him Woody. And he went during the invitation. You understand, this is unheard of in Baptist churches. He went during the invitation and said, Justin, if you want to go to the altar, I'll go with you. And that Thursday night, the last night of camp, Justin got saved. Sometime 10, 10.30 that night, old Woody said to me, he said, you know, Brother Campbell, he said, I've never had the privilege of being used by God before. And really, it just comes down to willingness and timing, right? There's so much that's outside of our hands and, you know, control freaks like me and others you know you have this illusion you're controlling certain things you're not you're just being a pain to a lot of people but there's just so much of this thing you can't control i had to go down to orlando friday night i probably shouldn't even say this i said some i said i'm gonna go down there i said i think i'll wait till in the morning Tamara, so Tamara says this horrible thing to me. She says, how old are you? I said, what do you mean? She says, you're not 90 years old. You could go tonight. <laughs> so I went and changed clothes. And at 7.50, left my house, went down I-4, passed downtown Orlando, bought something, and came back in a storm in 40 Five minutes. <laughs> Unheard of, right? Unheard of. Say, what do you say? I'm saying all things are possible to him that believeth, right? I wish I'd take a bets on that thing. But you know where that comes from. That comes from that mentality that says, I'm going to break the record, right? That's where it comes from. And I knew there was no need for me to look at the speedometer, right? I knew there was no need for that. Because you can't speed on I-4 anyway, not really. Secondly, an inescapable purpose, to glorify God personally. Secondly, to glorify God publicly. It says in the church. In the church by Christ and lastly, unto all ages 
world without end. Amen. To glorify God perpetually. Don't make the first time that we glorify God be when we get on the other shore. Don't let the only time we're going to be faithful to assemble up, right? You know, church, basic definitions that are called out assembly means you got to get together sometime. Let's don't wait till we get there to fulfill these purposes that God put within us. God has given us so much. Sometimes we think about the problems, we think about the schedule, the lack of sleep, whatever it is, the plans that we forget what we have, right? Leaders, here's what they tell you. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. We've got a lot. We have even more that is at our disposal. And Paul wrote to the next church in the order here, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for the word of God, for the opportunity to preach it. Lord, thank you for every soul that's here. Lord, my heart burns for those that aren't. I know there are some people that are hurting. Others are sick. Some may be traveling because we just don't know.